Okay, everybody, let's, um, let's march on. And um, one of the uh, things that I uh, said I would do, uh, which I, I want to do, which is to talk about uh, sidewalk uh, and the way it uh, fits into this course um, and how it leads us to the next subject of the course, uh, which is this uh, problem of catastrophe, war, and terror, which is the happy note we're going to uh, finish up on at the end of the term. And um, I hope I make it not as dark and uh, unhappy as, as it implies, because um, in fact I think there's some, um, um, some upbeat uh, elements to, to bring out and, and talk about. But let's talk about sidewalk. And um, sidewalk elements of, of what I'm going to talk about today, I've talked about in prior classes. So if it sounds familiar, that's why. And in fact, uh, I'd, I'd like it to sound familiar because after all, this is the last week of the semester. And it provides us an opportunity to use this book, Sidewalk, which I trust everyone is, has now read, uh, to think about many of the issues that have already come up in the class, but which we can now uh, kind of uh, use this book to, uh, to review and, and to look back at. So I, I think uh, almost from the beginning, uh, I've been talking about the problem of social order uh, as a kind of master problem for sociology. The way, it, because for, for us, uh, we don't want to take anything for granted. And so the fact that um, we all appear at more or less the, exactly the right time uh, for this lecture, 11 o'clock in the morning, the fact that it's going on all over this university, uh, and indeed universities uh, all over the world, uh, as well as a gazillion other things are happening, ha happening in an orderly way. We, uh, we don't want to take that for granted. Uh, and in a way, one way uh, of thinking about what sociology is, is that it's an attempt to make sense of this, to figure out how is it that social order is achieved um, in the first place, especially if we uh, think of ourselves, human beings, as different from other creatures for whom every act is determined by um, instinct and by genetic makeup. If we think that human beings are different than that, uh, which we do, then how is, it that, uh, it, how is it that order is possible? It just lends another dimension of, of mystery to it. And uh, one of the approaches uh, to trying to understand this issue of order and uh, disorder is to go to the spot, or at least one of the places, where disorder would seem most likely. And th that is Sixth Avenue uh, and uh, the folks who inhabit it. We are not talking about Wall Street uh, for, or NYU, places that in a way are famous for their orderliness. Uh, this is a place uh, at least in its uh, elements that De Niro is taking up, the world of uh, vendors um, uh, who are participating in the informal economy, uh, people who beg for money, <clears throat> people who are in periodic trouble with the law. Uh, this is a place of disorder, or so it seems. So we go to an extreme venue to see how disorder or how order can be achieved. And what we see that is that there is a kind of uh, possibility that indeed disorder does occur. And Denier documents instances of disorder uh, and alludes to the fact that some of the people on Sixth Avenue, uh, at least at other moments in their lives before they were doing the things that uh, Denier is uh, describing, had an attitude that he characterizes as fuck it. Um, and these are the people for whom the sociological bets are off. Uh, that in this course that we've been talking about, uh, they are different from what goes on. There's something like just bare life, survival in the most primitive sense of a creature being able to breathe and go from one moment to the next on Earth. And we see those people at least at moments and times when they are uh, in a fuck it mentality. We see them here in New York uh, in a way other people around this country and other people in the world don't, because these are those uh, huddled uh, sort of heap of a human being uh, that we see laying on the sidewalk, often with no shoes, 
um, in an extremely derelict uh, state of being. Uh, these are the people who are uh, not subject to so many of the phenomena that sociologists take for granted and that we've gone to great lengths to figure out how they work. But this is the exception, this fuck it attitude. And in fact, uh, De Niro is going to great lengths to show us that uh, the, the men who are make up his subject matter uh, do not have that attitude. Uh, and indeed, we can see them being concerned with the opinions of others. Uh, it matters to them what other people think of them. Uh, and a lot of their conversation, a good deal of it, has gossip qualities to it. And gossip is a sign of dignity uh, and of people participating very actively in the making up of society. Because it's all about, they didn't do that right, they didn't do that right, they're no good because they this, they're no good because of that. Uh, and anyone who is swept up even in the possibility of having gossip talked about them is swept up in that social world, in that sociality. And so the fact that uh, gossip does go on, um, and De Niro gives you some instances of that, tells you that uh, signals, um, at least uh, the beginning of that signal, that there is indeed concern for the opinion of others, and that the kind of, uh, of, of, of notions that George Herbert Mead and Irving Goffman talked about are in fact going on uh, among these men. We also see that they are actively involved in making their lives as well as others of, of their friends and colleagues um, and passers-by, uh, making up their lives. And we, one of the things we see is that the men acting out pride, um, dignity, um, and that includes their gender role, that they are, after all, men. They are, after all, in control. Now, of course, they're only in very limited control. And that's what makes, I think, so much of this book very poignant, is the way in which they are acting out their uh, urgency uh, to appear dignified and to be in control. But that capacity is uh, circumscribed by various limitations uh, that come from their particular place in society. But we can see that work. And, and I've just said um, the magic word, work. We can also see that for these men, for at least many of them, some of them, work is important. And this is a great problem for, for men who are, for the most part, unemployable um, in the uh, formal, uh, formal employment world. Uh, they have had drug problems. They currently do have drug or alcohol problems. They uh, have been in jails and prison, so they have prison records. And you know from uh, uh, past lectures and things you've read here in the class what a past prison record will do, um, especially for uh, an African-American man uh, who also lacks other credentials for participating in marriage uh, or participating in the formal job market. So we can see the street then as a kind of a rehabilitation station, that it's a place where people who are uh, disadvantaged uh, and who have had clear problems in their past find things to do that are rehabilitative. That is, they move them from jails and prisons, from fuck it attitudes, uh, into, um, into positive activity. And that that's what's going on, De Niro tells us, on Sixth Avenue. That these people are uh, actively participating in work of some kind, that they get a lot of out of that. It's a source of pride that they're doing that work, as opposed to being at the other end of that continuum um, and, come, and out of it. They're carefully watching one another. Um, and they are uh, engaged in manipulations of various sorts, of others and of the law. They are more or less informed about what the laws are that govern their behavior. Uh, they take them very seriously, um, know the edges of what can be done and what can't be done. And both because of law and because of the evaluations of others, they indeed restrain themselves uh, and act accordingly. So certain boundaries are not crossed. So they do not urinate or defecate, for example, in front of other people, uh, even though this is a great problem uh, for them uh, to find appropriate places uh, to relieve their bodies. 
this um, capacity for careful watching um, and knowing the boundaries and how to act in front of other people, both their friends and colleagues at work, as well as the passersby and the police, reminded me at least of Lord Humphrey's um, st study of the men's rooms uh, and the way in which um, th those men, which is seen as a site of, of um, deviance and disorganization, is in fact finely organized, extremely attuned to who might be coming uh, along and how one should behave in one way as opposed to another. It seemed to me that there is a kind of two examples, and I'm sure the course is filled with many, uh, as our lives are and our observ ordinary observations are, of this kind of fine-tuning, uh, as Goffman might have talked about it, uh, in the way that we watch uh, and do uh, and together construct a world of other possibilities, whether it's in the men's room or whether it's on Sixth Avenue um, and how that particular world works. And it is a world. Um, there is a, a famous book by We've talked about him in the past as well. Howard Becker, remember him from uh, a becoming a marijuana user uh, and how that's a kind of learned uh, trait, a learned activity. Well, Becker wrote a, a, a book, a famous book, called Art Worlds. And um, what Becker is trying to do in Art Worlds is to say that, listen, um, art is not about a, a great a great person, a great man um, who is filled with genius and cuts off his ear, and that's what art is. Um, and that's what the primary thing you need to keep uh, looking for. And Becker says, no, the art world is a history of art, of all the things that have come before. Um, it's people who, who run the galleries. Um, it's the critics. It's the art history courses in universities. Um, it's all of those things. Uh, and without it, there would not be art. Uh, and so art is constituted through this sort of amalgam of elements that together make up a world. Um, and so rather than saying artists are the center of the art world, he decenters the artist and says that well, let's look at all of them as in effect producing in a network um, a world that, um, of, that makes possible this component that we describe as an artist. So it's not just that, the look, we have to face the fact that the artist depends on the janitor who cleans up, who cleans up the studio uh, when the thing is done or when the show is over. It's not just it includes those people. They are intrinsic to it. Otherwise, uh, this whole machinery would not operate. Um, and so now let's go to um, Sixth Avenue and see the elements of this world uh, that he describes, that De Niro discovers and describes. Uh, well, we see this complex division of labor. There are table watchers. There are people who store other people's stuff. Uh, there are placeholders. There are the people who go through the uh, recycling, the hunters, and um, in effect wholesale the stuff to the people who sell it. These are just um, examples. You read about them, about them all. And how these all intersect with each other and operate is not done according to law. It is not done according to written contracts. It is all an informal system, which involves also a great deal of self-regulation of, for example, who is, can be in which spot, how the various vendors will relate to one another, what's a fair return when they buy magazines from their, their wholesaler. Um, and uh, as they struggle um, for specific niches, for places to sleep, um, toilets to go to, um, including a toilet, for today, a toilet um, uh, at a restaurant where they have to prove themselves a, a customer for today. And I very much appreciate the, the sign that is reproduced in the book where it advises people that the public restrooms are only available for today's customers. And I think in most of our worlds, we go, and it may say for customers only, but it doesn't say today's customers. And that's because it's aimed at these men who um, want to buy a cup of coffee on one day and then use the restroom on another day. And as we know, at times, they're not even allowed 
to use the restroom even when they buy something that day. Some things don't go according to even these informal rules. Uh, there are exceptions that are made, uh, a topic I'll get to in a moment. We also see that there is structured conflict uh, that these people have, uh, that the men on Sixth Avenue have with other people, with the merchants who, of course, um, don't like competition in front of their stores. They don't want other kinds of customers uh, to be uh, discouraged by the look of seeing uh, the merchandise and uh, the uh, booksellers out in front, by the dog walkers, the woman who quite famously we talked so much about in the class, and the neighborhood improvement associations, the business improvement districts, um, as they're called, that are trying to upgrade the neighborhoods um, in, which they, um, in which they do business. Now, all of these uh, conflicts um, come down on them um, as real forces. So for example, a lot of these people uh, were, uh, it, it, or people like them, used to be uh, making their lives in Penn Station, which for reasons that Denier points out, was a sustainable habitat. They could do all the things they do on Sixth Avenue, but in the comfort of an indoor space uh, compared to uh, this space. The fact that uh, Penn Station decided to clamp down on them, as have many neighborhoods um, uh, around New York, is a source of disorder um, in what is otherwise could be thought of as an orderly system of life. And I've been spelling out the orderly ways in which uh, they behave and in which they've constructed their worlds. And then when something like that happens, it is a disordering move uh, that uh, takes something that was once uh, a setup that could make their lives possible into something that is not a setup anymore. These men uh, are low uh, in the hierarchy. Um, they lack legitimacy to others, and their behaviors are under suspicion. They don't have a kind of routine claim of, you can't do that to me, uh, because not only am I a citizen, but I'm of a particular type of citizen, and people like me are not treated that way. And so they are m removed from Penn Station, um, and a disorder is imposed on them. Now, they regard that as an arbitrary move uh, because uh, what right do they have at Penn Station to do this to us? And so much of what the police do and what the law does is to them arbitrary. And Denier points out ways in which it is arbitrary uh, through various maneuvers and writings, uh, uh, writings that, he, that he gives us. And um, it, it involves um, treating what they do as uh, worthy of intervention, of creating disorder in, um, in a way that middle class people would not be uh, subject to. So uh, Denier tells us that the legitimate news business, the Daily News and its distributors, um, also can be suspected of being corrupt. The people who know the streets very well know that there is corruption here and there in the crevices of the city. Uh, but they come to suspect that it's much broader than that, and that, <coughs> excuse me, and that they're living in a world of hustles in which they are not the only people who are trying to hustle by uh, finding something that they got for nothing or that someone else got for nothing and then marking it up and selling it at a higher price, which in a way is a kind of hustle, uh, but that, and a periodically probably engaging in the sale of stolen materials, uh, that's a kind of hustle. But for them, that hustle they're engaged in is not all that different from other hustles that other people who are, are engaged in. And although Denier does not bring it up, um, but in this room we can well understand, uh, we could conceive of Wall Street um, and what um, some of the most august people in our society have been up to uh, as having been a vast hustle with consequences far greater than could be dreamt of uh, by all the men on Sixth Avenue and all the men on the, all the Sixth Avenues in terms of the damage uh, that they have done uh, to people's lives. Now, I don't know that these men have a clear, acute understanding of Wall Street and of the various hustles that go on here and there. But maybe they do know, for example, the very, very um, unequal 
um, treatment that's given to people who smoke crack versus people who smoke powder and, um, or who do powder. Uh, and um, it uh, might well be that um, they've never read the, an article like the Saints and Roughnecks, but they do have a sense that people who are operating in more or less the same way from the same sorts of motivations are treated very differently um, if they are white compared to if they're black, if they're men compared to if they're women, and if they're uh, rich compared to uh, if, they are, if they are very poor. And I doubt that uh, they have read an article like Dead on Arrival um, and the way in which being alive or even being conceived of as dead uh, rests on social uh, decisions that people make, distinctions that are contextual in their origins. Uh, I doubt they have indeed read that article, but they may have, I suspect they do, a sense of it being accurate. Uh, and um, if they did read the article uh, or saw the movie, if there was such a movie, I don't think they would find it nearly as surprising as most people in this room probably found it um, when they um, read it or when I talked about it uh, in class. Another way of talking about it is that uh, they have double consciousness. They know that there are um, ways of of, of looking that they must engage in because of their status in life uh, compared to um, other people's uh, kinds of ways of looking at the world. Uh, and they have to uh, look at the world uh, to, to survive in a different way than other people. Well, there's something else that Denier is doing, and now he takes us sort of farther along in the semester. And that is he's very aware of the social context that the men operate in and it tries to show the way those contexts, those larger social structural phenomena of the law itself and the way it's put together um, and then the way it's enforced uh, comes down on their lives. I'm, um, I'm, I was already talking about that to a degree, but I'll face it um, more, um, more uh, directly and bring up the varied kinds of conditions that structure their lives that make their sidewalk a world and um, constitute what that world is. So um, there is the law on printed matter. Uh, it's against the law um, to sell merchandise on the street um, in, in places like Greenwich Village and Sixth Avenue, but it is not against the law to sell printed matter. And that's because liberals in New York, and New York has liberals, uh, and um, quite a few of them, and has for decades and decades and decades, uh, New York was a place where uh, it was said that, wait a minute, uh, people do have a right to sell things on the street because it could be printed matter, and that is the way information can circulate. That's the way our democracy uh, operates. And so we must indeed exchange uh, materials, opinions. Uh, John Stuart Mill said, where opinions are free, truth shall prevail. And so we need a way for truth to prevail. And that means that people have to be able to sell printed matter on the street. So um, it, a liberal city like New York um, has, uh, a pl has that in their legal code that you can sell printed matter. They have, a, of course, the men on the street exploited that opportunity um, and expanded to all sorts of printed matter, not just stuff that involves uh, civil liberties or politics. Um, and indeed, they also sell a little merchandise um, on, the side, um, on the side as well. In Greenwich Village, uh, there are other structural forces, uh, contextual forces uh, that are operating. And uh, one of them is that there are liberals uh, in Greenwich Village, uh, more so than New York as a whole. And these uh, nice people, liberals, support the, uh, the people on the streets by, for example, donating books and magazines so that they can be sold. And they also support them against the police uh, at times and make it more difficult for the policies of, for example, Mayor Giuliani, quality of life, law and order, to come down wholesale on these people. And um, especially nowadays with uh, video phones and all that, if you saw someone being uh, beaten up uh, as a Greenwich Villageite, uh, which we all are, you might well protest you might well make a photo, you may well make a video, and that constrains uh, what can be done. Uh, and that's also part of what's going on. 
The master thing that's going on, though, are these interventions on behalf of the quality of life. It's put even liberal Greenwich villagers on edge and causes them to be not so sure that they always want to take the side of the poor and the working class. By the way, right now in Greenwich Village, there's a, uh, a lot of controversy going on over the piers because one of the piers, the 12th Street Pier, um, has become a late night. Um, does anyone live near that pier? No. Um, well, anyway, it's in the heart of Greenwich Village, and um, uh, except it's on the edge because it goes into the ocean, uh, into the river. Uh, but uh, that pier has become a kind of night headquarters for uh, queer and transgendered kids from all of the boroughs. And so Greenwich Village now has to deal with the fact uh, that after it has become so affluent, um, its liberal population, which it primarily is, um, has to deal with the noise, the traffic, the, um, the craziness, must be said, of kids who are uh, escaping from the other boroughs um, to this neighborhood. And so it sets in motion a kind of more tension, Tom and Jerry, how far should we allow them to go, how far shouldn't we allow them to go, that has divided uh, the Greenwich Village uh, white liberal community itself. Uh, and not just white liberal community, but African American uh, and other people of other races and ethnicities in Greenwich Village who are trying to make Greenwich Village, uh, uh, to keep it as a genteel, uh, pleasant place to be, um, to make sure it's uh, decent, at least in the way defined by Greenwich Village, uh, as a, 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 which is far more open than, say, in Arizona, uh, to make it decent. Um, and to keep it that way, uh, but is somehow dealing with uh, these, this heritage of race, class, and sexuality uh, harassments that um, people have had that make this a, a place of escape. So it's in a way parallel to what the sidewalk is and what to do with the sidewalk and how to make it work. Well, we see that one of the things that goes on is the arbitrary exercise of authority. Again, arbitrary for the people who are the victims of it. Um, we, I think, don't very often run into uh, the arbitrary authority of the police in Greenwich Village or probably hardly anywhere else in New York, although it does happen, as we know from the bicycle case, which I assume people here uh, know about the policeman shoving the bicycle rider um, down um, and making its way through the courts um, right now. But we see. Um, examples of how authority works in the village in very concrete ways through Denier's uh, sidewalk study. And so we see him um, at Christmas. And uh, you all know the story, which is that uh, the other men were not able to set up at Christmas on the street. Um, no reason could be given. I'm reminded um, during the uh, lead up to the Vietnam War protests, or it was actually during the protests, uh, the, uh, the left in the Democratic Party uh, was pressing forward the anti-war candidate of a man named Eugene McCarthy. And um, in those days, there was a slogan of, be clean for Gene. That is, don't you know, cut your hair um, and uh, dress in a kind of uh, Ivy League-y, preppy way, uh, as opposed to the hippie, hippy-dippy kind of uh, look, uh, radical look, uh, Mao uh, t-shirt look. Uh, che Guevara t-shirts, uh, clean for Gene. And um, at the Democratic um, Convention in Chicago, the police, the Chicago police, invaded the headquarters of the McCarthy campaign. McCarthy w came rather close. I mean, this is not some out in way left field uh, process, nomination process. He came quite close. Hubert Humphrey instead got the nomination. Hubert Humphrey had been vice president of the United States. But the police invaded the McCarthy headquarters and just started destroying everything, confiscating materials, shoving everybody out of the way. And one of the uh, sincere McCarthy uh, volunteers said, or staff members said, on what grounds? And the police said, coffee grounds. Uh, and that always struck my mind, because at, at the end of the day, it's coffee grounds. If you are, if the, if the system is lined up in that way, then the grounds are coffee grounds. 
And so these are people who face coffee grounds. Uh, Mitch himself, uh, uh, Denier, was amazingly brazen. And the first time I read this, I thought I would never do that. Um, and never have done that. Uh, never will do that. Uh, is I'll never talk to a cop like that because I would think they would indeed break my face. Uh, that's my attitude toward the police. Um, and, uh, but he keeps talking back. And as we see, he gets away with it. Not only do they not break his face, but they allow him to stay. Uh, and you see them negotiating their own dignity, their own face, their own capacities, and with one another um, as, uh, as they're doing that. Uh, as they are not breaking his face and not forcing him out. Now, there is a larger um, literature on what is called, and it, I, I, I think this comes from political science, um, sidewalk justice. And maybe it's a sociologist. I can't remember who we should give exact credit to. But the idea is that, listen, um, all these organizations and their rules and regulations, something we've talked about when we talked about rules and laws, are far too complicated. Uh, and by the time you get to the sidewalk, in this case, this idea of sidewalk justice, justice is talking about the police uh, and the way they have got to dispense justice. Uh, if they did all the things they're supposed to do, uh, life in New York would, would come to a stop. They can't exactly fulfill all the laws. Um, one thing I've studied um, in recent years is the uh, subway system of New York, particularly concentrating on the campaigns of, um, of security. And you've all seen the signs that say, if you see something, say something. Well, uh, there are so many somethings to be seen in this crazy city that if we all did that, the employees of the system would just be spending all of their time hearing our reports of what we saw uh, because we're always seeing something. We're all, and the subway system has empty bags for uh, stuff, boxes laying around. Often it's the very stuff of some contractor or the cleanup crews or whatever. The point is, is that we don't say something every time we see something uh, and, uh, and for a good reason. And what uh, uh, I learned with my PhD student who I was doing the research with is that nor do the people who work there. When someone says something, when, because people do sometimes say, I saw something, there's a suspicious package on the platform at uh, X station or Y station or whatever. And what they do, if they do anything, is go out and kick it. Um, or it, it's, it's like in, in, uh, on the television shows, the detective shows, the guy goes, like that, he says, yep, it's arsenic. Uh, they, they, that's, they, you can't um, call the bomb squad every time anything like this happens. And if you did, the system would come to a halt. The trains, because there's a whole rigmarole of what they have to go through in terms of filling out forms, stopping the train, calling in the bomb people, and all the rest of it. We would not have a subway system in New York. So they know not to be a dope and only a complete jerk would actually follow the rules. Only a complete jerk among us would see, say something every time we saw something. And only a complete jerk who worked for the subway system would actually uh, obey those rules. And so on the sidewalk, it's the same story. That um, you don't uh, read the Miranda rights to somebody before you confiscate their stuff. Uh, you don't always confiscate their stuff, even when they are breaking the rule because they're, they're too close to the entry door and it's only 19 feet, not, it's, it's not 20 feet. Um, they, um, uh, and, and sometimes, yeah, they'll poke them around a little bit. Uh, sometimes they push them over on their bicycle. Uh, whatever it takes, um, given the various constraints and demands that are on you to make it happen. And police engage routinely in sidewalk justice. It's the only way there can be any kind of order. We're getting back to that order problem um, uh, once again. And so we see that, yes, sometimes they sell shit, uh, the guys on the street, and a blind eye is turned to that. Sometimes not. Sometimes they're given some mercy when they uh, have to leave their uh, stuff alone. But often it's just confiscated and destroyed. Um, no matter what, it's a kind of uh, coffee grounds for you. 
Um, and on the other hand, we see what happens when a nice uh, middle-class family from Vermont starts selling some stuff on the street, almost as though it came out of a Hollywood movie. This family is named the Romps. Uh, and uh, they're all um, uh, intruding on pedestrians walking past as they sell their Christmas trees in a far greater way than the men are when they're selling their stuff. Uh, but they are, are tolerated. More than being tolerated, well, we learn that the neighbors give them the keys to their apartment. And even, we, we know, uh, as good as and liberal and nice as the neighbors are, to the men selling stuff on the sidewalk, but for example, bringing them stuff, donating stuff, nobody gives them their keys uh, to their apartment and tells them uh, you can use it uh, one whatever you want. So it's a kind of complicated um, negotiation that goes on with, and we've discussed this um, in, in our class, with always the latent functions of the organization uh, in operation. And my conversation with you about uh, the subway system uh, is uh, one clear instance of that. The purpose, the function of, this, uh, of these rules is to keep the system moving. Uh, and the function of the rules that affect the sidewalk are to provide a kind of nice and decent life for the people who live in Greenwich Village and who come around to Greenwich Village, but in ways, because it's a liberal community, that do not um, engage in a violent way with the men uh, who are making up the social order, the world of that sidewalk, um, and how it operates. Still another way of talking about all of this is to say, um, well, well, one other I, just thing I want to point out is that it's, when, you, when we talked about the um, experiments, the Sharif experiments, and, the, and conformity, and the way that process works, and the way in which people uh, uh, are, have to answer which line is a different line than the other line. Well, in a way, that's what we're talking about with sidewalk justice, is what is the line, where is the line, uh, both figurative and literally, since they have to be behind certain lines when they sell their stuff. And uh, I invite you, those lines are actually, um, unless the weather has eliminated them, but I've seen them uh, on, on the sidewalk, the lines where they have to stand. And they can't stand anywhere outside those lines. Well, if you go and look carefully, you'll see that they kind of don't always do that. They are moving outside of the lines. They sometimes have their stuff outside of the lines. And so where is the line? How far is the line? Is it 19 feet from the door right now? Or is it 21 feet from the door right now? All of this is in, to some degree, the eyes of the beholder, just like it was in the um, experiments that you read about, uh, that you read earlier in the this, in this semester. So there is uh, another kind of grand way of talking about this, a structuration process of the sidewalk world. Um, all of these people are participating in it. All of these elements are making it up. Uh, and uh, the more that, as people play their roles, they strengthen uh, that order, uh, that way of doing a world. And that means all these elements that I've been talking about of how you can treat the men, how you can't treat the men, what the men can do and can't do, uh, how aggressive they can be in their panhandling, how unaggressive they uh, need to be in their panhandling, and so forth and so on. So I hope uh, you will look that book over uh, again and try to see in it some of these themes that I've been talking about uh, and the way in which that world is put together, constructed, and made durable from one day to the next. The curtain goes up uh, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, and it is reconstituted in essentially the same way from day to day, just like our course is. Here we are filled with formal rules, uh, a registrar, a schedule, a system. They don't have that but it has been, in effect, enacted through the spontaneous participation of some, the legal participation and formal participation of others. Uh, but it has a durability and a permanence, a part of our lives, a part of the life of the city um, and of, of, of the world. And it's repeated all over 
uh, from one part of the, uh, of the earth to another as human beings congregate in more or less this way. Well, this note of um, mass participation, as it were, of different uh, people coming together and making something happen uh, in a world of, uh, uh, of informality, uh, heavily at least informality, uh, takes us really to uh, the last topic of the course, um, happily called Catastrophe, War, and Terror. And there is a kind of um, uh, overarching attitude uh, toward m many people's uh, understanding of what happens when there is catastrophe, war, and terror. Uh, add disaster to that list. Uh, what do people do? Um, and thus, how do we respond to it when it happens? And there's really a profound issue that's involved in that imagination of what people do. And the profound issue is, in effect, what's the default of the human condition? So here we are all making our lives here at NYU, just like they're making all their lives on Sixth Avenue. Uh, but what would happen if something ha big happens that disrupts the whole thing? Uh, a fire um, in the building, a, uh, a bomb, uh, heaven forbid, that goes off, um, like September 11th. The reason, of course, why you have, we have this massive security apparatus here at NYU. Um, it increased in great intensity uh, after September 11th. It's always shocking to me, and I know you've had this experience, when you go to another university, um, Cornell, uh, which well, I'll keep using all semester long, Cornell, a land of lawns, it's also a land of no guards. You just go in buildings, out buildings, it's kind of weird feeling. I mean, you know, I always think I should steal something at least. Um, uh, these people are so uh, open. Actually, my mind does not work that way. I have, I have all the stuff I want. Um, but it's um, a kind of, um, uh, it was intensified uh, and um, it, what is the uh, sort of default orientation to people, what they'll do when, when what has been the basis of social order breaks down and there is no longer that kind of ongoing basis? What will they actually do? And how do they behave? Well, really, I think a very common orientation is that it's chaos. And the, the, the evil twins are panic uh, and looting. Uh, that people, uh, that, the, that the human instinct, the animal of us, um, the, um, the default uh, orientation to the world will rise up. We no longer, uh, we can get away with it. Uh, there's chaos. The police are busy doing something else. Maybe they're not there at all. So it's a chance to steal. Uh, and in any event, uh, we or other people who aren't stealing are in a panic, uh, and they jump all over each other, scream and yell. We've seen the horror movies of the, ah, you know, like that. Everyone is screaming and yelling um, and uh, 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 peeing in their pants, and it's all, it's all one crazy thing. Now, if you, this is consequential, because if that's what you think is true, uh, and, for example, that's the image of Katrina, uh, then you respond uh, accordingly. And that means that you uh, put in troops to maintain social order because you have all these people who are running around and screaming. Uh, that's no way to get anything done now, is it? So you've got to go in and impose social order. And troops are the way to do that. You need to come in with um, people who are from agencies, from bureaucracies, who, um, who are the official people who take control when something like this is going on. Uh, the people from emergency management, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Uh, and things are predicated on FEMA coming through. And that's the way this thing will be solved. Um, and police, of course, um, to deal with the looting that is imminent and is about to explode, and everyone will take over and do this. Now, I don't know if you remember, um, it, I assume you're has everybody in the, raise your hand if you saw some of the television coverage, live coverage of what was going on in New Orleans during Katrina. Raise your hand. So most people were around and uh, it was post-birth and 
uh, all that, um, um, and, and post watching news, uh, then you may have seen what I saw, which is uh, what was called looting. And we saw the same footage of the same scene again and again and again. Uh, and it's black people taking stuff. Now, th there's um, two ways of talking about what they were doing. One of them is looting. Another is provisioning, because there was a terrible need. Um, there's no one to buy anything from, uh, because people have left New Orleans. Uh, they have, they're dead. Um, or their home, they're worried about their own families. And so the only way to gain provision is to somehow get into the stores and take it. Now, it's also true that you don't need to survive by taking a television set, although it can come in handy if you want to know what's going on in the world. And in any event, all of this stuff is going to disappear anyway. Here's, here's, the, uh, here's the news. The news really is a remarkable little bit of looting that's actually done in these catastrophes. And this is true for most of the world. We now have serious studies. Um, there are major research centers, actually only in three universities, this isn't very much funded, where people do look at what actually goes on um, when these crises occur. And the overwhelming evidence is that people, is that looting is actually rare although provisioning is common. And once again, people have pointed out that when uh, there was a bias in the news, when black people uh, were provisioning, it was called looting. Uh, when white people are provisioning, it's called provisioning, or uh, taking care of their families, or whatever else. I'm not saying this is always the case, obviously, um, but it's a tendency that critics of the media and of the coverage have pointed out. What, it, what is not so subtle is the massiveness in which people do not loot. Um, and the, the, the twin of that is the massiveness in which they do not panic. Um, that is something they don't do. Um, uh, they instead, and now this then lends itself to the other interpretation of what the default is when things break down as they've been going on in the past, uh, and that is that people are very decent, uh, and that what they do is attend to one another, that there are spontaneous systems that are set up that somehow emergent out of the scene, um, uh, even in times of danger uh, and anxiety, uh, what emerges out of the scene are mechanisms in which people take care of one another. Uh, rather than stepping all over um, each other's bodies. So ex some examples of that, um, well, September 11th, which Rebecca Solnit, who you're reading this term, uh, does describe uh, in some detail as she describes other aspects of panic, or excuse me, of catastrophe and disaster and the lack of panic that takes place. She presses the envelope very much on this idea of panic and looting by saying that the primary thing that goes on uh, is people helping people. And she even goes so far as to call it a paradise. A paradise built in hell is the name of her book, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster. So one of the things that we think we know from September 11th, for example, um, is not that 3,000 people died, which is about right. That's about how many people died but that anywhere from 15 to 18,000 people survived. And in a way, that is the more striking phenomenon, um, is that that is the number of people. Uh, we don't know how many people were actually in the towers. We don't know how many people were on the, uh, on, in the plazas. We don't know how many people were subject to death from the collapse of those buildings. The real number is probably much greater uh, because of the number of people who could have had stuff fall on them um, in the uh, neighborhood um, if uh, they had hung around, but they indeed got out. That massive exit was managed in an orderly way as people then um, used the stairways, which were ordinary building stairways um, uh, uh, that had been built in that building years and years before. Those stairways carried those people out. 
And in my imagination, I find that phenomenal because you obviously have a very, um, uh, a, a very varied population of old people, of, uh, of crippled people, of, uh, of women in high-heeled shoes. I assume the shoes came off. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, they got out. And in all the accounts, we don't have any accounts of those stairways becoming clogged with human beings, thus restricting the exits of other human beings. Somehow or other, um, the very, very large numbers of people came out. And that indicates that uh, there wasn't panic. So what this does tell us is that, on the whole, um, these things go on um, in this kind of way. Um, what, another research project I, I have been engaged in in recent years is a research project uh, about Katrina. And one of my jobs was to interview people who had uh, warned about the storm coming. I, I talked a little bit about that um, in, a, in a, our prior meeting. Uh, but also the people from the emergency management services that were located there in the Gulf. And one of the people I talked to was the head of emergency management uh, for the parish. That's what they call a county there, is the parish. The parish that is the northern and the largest in population uh, parish surrounding uh, on the northern and, and it bends around um, New Orleans of the city itself. Uh, and he said to me that the, uh, all the exercises that they had been done, all the practice runs they've done, and they've done a lot, involved the federal government. And they were supposed to be able to cope on their own for 72 hours. Uh, and of course, that is not what happened. The, they got no aid from the state or federal government uh, for days and days, uh, at which point the, this hor all these horrible things had already taken place. And he said when he did get the first contact he had frightened him to death because he's in his emergency management building. And along comes, uh, he described it as, it looked like a posse from a Western movie because it's these heavily armed men with bandoliers, about 50 armed men. And he thought, my god, they're going to take over the country. They're taking over the building. In other words, he thought that these were outlaws who were uh, using uh, this opportunity of this order to in some kind of conquest. I mean, he quickly saw that wasn't the case. But to him, it was just so outrageous that in this moment when they were desperate for medicine, uh, for water, for mechanisms to restore electricity and power, um, instead, um, and, and evacuations, instead, what they get is military force. And we saw that again, and you still see it here in the New York subways, uh, that um, one, of the th one of the ways, besides telling people if you see something, say something, as though that is going to uh, do anything, uh, the other thing that you're going to do is have men with weapons. Uh, down there. And, and those are uh, especially intensely placed at our biggest stations, like at Times Square. Um, we still see men with automatic weapons, troops with automatic weapons, and armed police. Um, and of course, what that presumes is that, what that presumes is that people who are going to bomb us, um, and we know they primarily live um, in the outer suburbs because it's hard to make bombs and things like that in the middle of Manhattan. Rents are very high. Um, and getting the chemicals in and out of the building uh, is no easy thing. Whereas out in Queens, the outer boroughs, you can have a car, you can have a station wagon even. Um, and uh, no muss, no fuss. Uh, you can um, get, your, get your work done. So it presumes that someone will make their bomb in Queens um, and then somehow come into the city and find a place to park and then go down in Times Square with your bomb uh, it, in order to uh, re do havoc, as opposed to coming in from the outer boroughs, which are much less heavily policed. Um, and indeed, you can't. How could you possibly police all those stations, hundreds of New York subway station, stations, each one with multiple 
entrances and exits, how would you ever possibly uh, be able to, to deal with that? Um, it isn't very promising at all. Anyway, what these indicate is there are different ways to respond to threat, um, catastrophe, and danger. And one version is premised on the fact that people are up to no good, uh, they're evil, um, and the response is military. Uh, even when, as I, the example I just gave you of, of seeing these armed people in, the, in our subway stations, uh, even when it absolutely makes no sense, uh, even within their own framework of worrying about people who are going to uh, repeat September 11th um, and do a horrible thing in the city. It prevents rationality, I think, on, in any way um, by having this orientation toward what goes on when catastrophe happens or when, when, when there's a threat of catastrophe taking place. It just colors the whole imagination. And what Rebecca Solnit says, in remarkable contrast, is she's saying, in effect, no, no, no. The human condition is to be helpful to other human beings. And the human condition is to be able to self-organize in ways that are just remarkable. And we see that from history, that they do that um, again and again. As in England, the Blitz was their uh, finest hour. And indeed, one of the kind of things she speculates about is that so many of the things that we've occupied ourselves with in this course, uh, cross pressures, dilemmas of if you uh, double binds, if you satisfy them, you don't satisfy them, the rules that are coming from everywhere and are just impossible to actually uh, put into play that what happens in a disaster is all of that is washed away. That in a disaster, you get in touch with what she regards as the core human quality, which she says is the capacity and the desire to help other human beings. And that's why she says it's a paradise. That it just feels wonderful to not have to think about or worry about anything other than the well-being of other creatures. And that that is what she thinks happens um, in the context of these disasters. And if you have that imaginary about what goes on, uh, about what human nature is at its most fundamental level, then you change the way you cover a disaster when it occurs in terms of media. You change the way you deploy um, assistance um, from being police and military to being, I don't know, doctors and social workers. You alter the consequence of what disaster is in fact uh, if you um, imagine disaster ahead of time one way as opposed to another. Imagine human beings, human nature as one thing uh, as opposed to another. So we're going to continue talking about disasters next time. Um, and that's our uh, last time. So um, everybody come. It'll be our last chance to uh, be together. I wish I could serve drinks uh, and bring in the caterers, but they won't allow that in the building. Uh, so I'll see you uh, at our rendezvous.